Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Brass 101. My name is Tom Kelly, and I'll be your host this evening. We appreciate you taking the time to join us on this uh, beautiful fall evening. I hope it is wherever you are. Snow is starting to fly in different places around the country, and it's time to start to think about snow safety. I want to just walk through some of the protocols for tonight before we begin with Cindy Burlack making some opening comments. Uh, we will have uh, some opening comments, as I said, from Cindy Burlack. Uh, she will introduce Dale Atkins, our instructor this evening, and from there we will present about 45 or 50 minutes of snow safety education. That will be followed by a question and answer period, your opportunity to ask any questions you want about snow safety. And then after that, at about probably 55 after the hour, uh, we'll bring on Bodie Miller. For our athlete guest this evening, he is fresh back from the World Cup openers in Solden, where he launched his Peak Ski brand in Europe. Uh, we'll then wrap things up with Off Piste. Occasionally during the course of the evening, you will see a QR code pop up on the uh, upper right hand side of your screen. And we have it up on the screen right now. We encourage you to take your phone out scan the code, and drop a few dollars to brass. We present these Avalanche Safety Programs free of charge. We've been doing this for the last five years online, and every little dollar that you can contribute to brass makes a difference in our being able to provide this type of education. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce someone who has really been a driving force behind the Bryce and Ronnie Athletes Snow Safety Foundation. In 2015, she lost her son, Ronnie Burlack, and since then, she's dedicated her life to making sure that others don't have to go through the tragedy that she and the Astles did back in 2015. Brass has now started to make an impact, uh, particularly in competition circles around the country and actually with its advocacy around the world. So with that, my pleasure to introduce Cindy Burlack. Cindy? Hi, everybody. It's good to be here tonight. Uh, tonight, you'll learn some simple truths that Ronnie and Bryce and the high-level ski race they were with in 2015 did not know. This lack cost our fabulous young athletes their lives in an avalanche. Please listen so your families don't have to go through what we have and still are. Their memory is bringing you this program, and we are comforted that you are here. We'd like to thank our sponsors tonight, World Cup Supply, U.S. Ski and Snowboard, Backcountry Access, and the many generous donors like you. We're psyched to have Bodie here tonight. Uh, he grew up just miles, a few miles down the road. When he was a little boy, I'd see him often skiing up at our local Cannon Mountain, We'd take some runs together and he could keep up. He didn't talk much and he was always there, making him pretty much a great little companion. Several decades later, as you know, Bodhi had a great career. And at age 15, Ronnie was at Copper getting ready for a race. He saw Bodhi across the room and went over, hey, Bodhi, what you doing? Bodhi said, hi, Ronnie, I'm racing. Bodie, Ronnie beamed, me too. It was probably one of Ronnie's proudest moments to be in the same race as his idol. Talk about idols, our presenter tonight is one of mine. Dale has been working in, in avalanches and rescues for over 40 years. He's passionate about saving lives and about educating. Starting out as a ski patroller, he went on to be a forecaster for Colorado Avalanche Information Center, CAIC, for most of his career. Dale's research focused on accidents and rescues, and he's authored technical books, technical papers, books, and consulted on ski films. He's a past president for American Avalanche Association and the president, past president of International Commission for Alpine Rescue. He's worked for RECO, perfecting their reflector chips and detectors. Today, he works and trains ski patrollers, mountain guide, mountain rescuers around the world. We so appreciate having Dale Atkins as a guiding force for BRASS, the Bryce and Ronnie Athlete Snow Safety Foundation. Here's Dale. 
Thank you, Cindy, and thank you all for coming out tonight and spending your evenings, your evening with us. Um, if you just a, another bit of a kind of housekeeping with this, if you uh, have questions, I think you can drop them into uh, the the chat window, and Tom will keep an eye on it. Uh, we might miss them, but do bring them up uh, towards the end of of my portion when we do have a Q and A session. So with that, let's go ahead, Tom, and we'll jump into uh, this evening's program. So we're gonna cover a half dozen or so topics tonight. We're gonna talk about why avalanche education is important. And the bottom line there is that most people trigger their own avalanche. So that tells me as a forecaster and a researcher that most accidents, well, they should be preventable. So we'll talk a little bit about education. We're gonna talk about avalanches. Um, we're going to go over the different approaches that ski areas around the world use for mitigating the avalanche threats in their areas. And uh, we'll highlight some resources that where you can go to get information from around the world and also locally. And we'll end with talking about avalanche, uh, not just the rescue equipment, but some of the other equipment we should carry with us when we're heading even just outside of the ski area boundaries. So I think these are two impressive slides because avalanches happen anywhere there's steep slopes and snow. You can see Park City last spring on the run out of the jump hill. Yeah, if, if you're into doing uh, kickers and jumping, whether it, in, especially in the back country or outside of the ski areas, a good outrun is actually probably a good avalanche slope. And if we look at the photo on the right from Verbier uh, from last April, you can see a whole bunch of tracks going into the fracture line. Well, the fracture line wasn't there originally, but a whole bunch of those tracks were. And two of the uh, World Cup competitors for free skiing skied onto that slope, triggered an avalanche, and they were just skiing over to the venue. They were just kind of um, going along from Mount Ford to the venue and took a nasty ride that actually flushed them all the way down and out of view at the bottom of the photo. And one of them was pretty seriously hurt. And that was right at one of the world's great ski areas. Let's go to the next one, Tom. Boy, avalanches happen in area. <laughs> so I think if you give it another click, and Tom and I are working as a team. But this is from a, a FIS slope style, a slope side World Cup event. Uh, last winter I, at Team, and the avalanche started out of area, came down into area. And look, there's another one going into the venue. And remarkably, nobody was injured. I suspect there may have been some soil shorts, but I don't know on that. But it just serves as a reminder that we are we're in nature's playground, and, and this is the world of avalanche. And we've got to be ready. Inside the ski areas and even outside. And speaking of inside the ski areas, while avalanches, well, those sorts of accidents are a bit, a bit more common in Europe, they do happen here in our own backyards. Uh, last winter, big winter, especially in Little Cottonwood Canyon, but there was an avalanche that ran into the Snowbird Resort. And so again, uh, avalanches can happen outside of the ski area and even come into the ski area. When we look at this, there's two things to point out here. I'll start with the numbers on the left with the average avalanche fatalities per season. And in North America and Europe, about 135 to uh, about 150 people die in avalanches each year. And the vast majority of them are outdoor uh, sportsmen and women, skiers and riders and snowmobilers, especially in North America. So about 150 between Europe and North America. If we look across the whole globe in the rest of the world, in an average winter, a typical winter, about another 150 to 300 people die in avalanches across Asia, South America, in New Zealand, occasionally even in Australia, Japan. So Worldwide, about three to 500 people die in avalanches 
each year. The big numbers uh, in, in Asia are not so much the skiers, uh, very few, it's actually climbers, but most of those victims are villagers. Uh, when villages get hit and wiped out, or they're traveling on roads, on the mountain passes and they get hit by avalanches. When we look at the multicolors there, up we can go back one just if we, a sec Tom, we look at those multicolors of North and South America and Europe, we're actually looking at a map of the climate zones or classifications around the world. You can see there's a whole lot of different colors, especially in the mountainous areas. And there's a big difference in the colors between the Western US and the mountains in, in Europe. So with many different climate zones, that also means there's many different climate zones for avalanches. And what you've learned about avalanches locally in your home area or your home region may not fully apply to some of those other places in the world. And you get to some places in, in Europe, <clears throat> and literally as you, you change countries, or from one side of the country to another, you're gonna change snow and avalanche conditions. Excuse me. We can go to the next one. And you go ahead and start the video. Wow, just skiing along. This is from Crans Montana in Switzerland. Avalanche starts out of area, crashes down onto literally just a beginner or intermediate groomed ski run. The piece. And this is just another example of avalanches that can get us in trouble, even despite the best efforts of the ski patrols. When we're talking about avalanches, the, the definition of an avalanche is just snow moving downhill, but we sometimes think of it as a triangle with the avalanche terrain, unstable snow, and trigger. And those are the ingredients that we need for an avalanche. So let's go to the next one, Tom, and we'll take a look now at our avalanche terrain. And the terrain is really important because that's the one variable that doesn't change. All the other variables, the, the weather, the snow structure, the human factors, those can change, but the terrain is consistent. And we can decide when and where we go onto that terrain. And most avalanches occur on slopes of 30 to 45 degrees in steepness. How steep is 30 degrees? Well, that's kind of about where the black diamond ski runs start, the advanced ski runs and double black diamond runs are generally even just in the mid 30s. So it's prime time avalanche terrain. And as someone who will be going into outside of the ski areas or the backcountry, you've got to learn not just to judge slope angles, but to measure slope angles because that's a hard number. If I tell you that slope is 32 degrees in steepness, you know that that is avalanche terrain. If I tell you the snow is six inches deep, it's composed of spatial dendrites and stellar crystals and has a temperature of minus six degrees C, I haven't told you anything avalanche wise, maybe gave you some hints on how to wax, but that's it. So terrain and learning to, to measure the terrain, the slope angles, and being a good judge of slope angles is really key to staying safe in avalanche terrain. If we look at that map on the right with a lot of the online mapping products, like this is a Cal Topo one, you can get slope shading that will show you the slope angles, uh, the different, and they're very general. Don't trust your life to these, but it gives you a really good idea. And with practice and experience, you can learn how to use these maps to help navigate when you're in the backcountry or outside your local resorts. So terrain traps. I mentioned how terrain is really important. And I'm gonna go from right to left here. We're gonna start with the accident on the right at Snowmass. This was a fatal avalanche and it only ran not even 30 vertical feet. And it buried somebody a couple of feet deep. He even had a couple of friends with him. And unfortunately, they didn't have rescue equipment and they were also on downhill equipment on alpine gear and his friends ended up down slope about two three hundred uh meters and then this fellow triggered the avalanche right at the bottom of this little slope that pushed him over and buried him the so snow was so deep and soft that his friends without climbing skins 
they had to wallow post hole up through thigh deep snow to get back to their buddy. And it just took so long to do that. Even though they found them quickly, when they got there, it still took them too long to get there. So even those small slopes can be just as deadly as the big ones. When we look at Mount Hood, and I think many of you are very familiar with uh, training at Mount Hood, especially in the summer. <clears throat> so when we look at all the, the lanes on the Palmer snowfield there, and up the mountain towards the hog's back and pearly gates towards the summit, yeah, that's glacial terrain and looks like pretty sporty and even spicy skiing. And if you get a chance to go to Europe, you're gonna have some great fun when you're able to ski on the glaciers or even a few places in, in North America. I wanna talk about glacier skiing for just a moment. And Tom's gonna to bring up a video here because when you're skiing on glaciers, they're basically like a beginner or intermediate ski run. Nice and smooth, everything's going great until you fall in a crevasse. Look at this. This is what you don't wanna have ever happen to you. Fortunately, the skier stopped on this little ledge. I think it was about 40 feet down. But you can see that hole goes a whole lot further down in the glacier. So skiing on glaciers, easy skiing, but very high risk, very high consequence. Something to do with a guide and with the right equipment. Oh, oh I don't know if you heard that whole lacoon. Um, in French, some of you may recognize that, but basically it means kind of like, uh, I'm an idiot. I think he's a really lucky one. And that's, uh, this is the time you want to be lucky. And he escaped with the help of the local rescue team. So watch out for terrain traps. And terrain traps are anywhere that even a small avalanche can have serious consequences where the snow can pile up, push you over a cliff, down into a crevasse or birch run or even into a creek or, or, or lake. So just a quick review about the terrain. Uh, again, it's so important to be able to, to not just judge the slope angles, but to measure those slope angles uh, because that's avalanche terrain. And connected terrain, well, that's the terrain that's up above you. Uh, and you can trigger avalanches on flat slopes at the bottom of steep slopes. So if we look at the uh, Nordic skiers with the Engadine Ski Club in Eastern Switzerland, they're having a great time skiing across the lake, but they're headed towards avalanche terrain with the slope in the distance. That on the flats with steep slopes above, that's connected terrain. And it's what can happen is kind of like pulling the log out of the bottom of a wood pile. The snow can collapse underfoot then those fractures propagate across the flats and up slope and then tear the snow out on the steeper slopes above. So got to learn that terrain and then just be leery of those terrain traps. As I said, that's anywhere where even a small avalanche or any avalanche is going to have real serious consequences. So quick look at terrain. We're going to look at unstable snow and the trigger because we need to have unstable snow. So what's that? We've got to have something to trigger, give it a shove to get it going. So let's jump to the next one, Tom, if you would, please. So in the picture on the left, you can see that light layer of snow that's running across. And this is a little column of snow that's backlit by sunlight, but that's low density, soft snow. And that's a weak layer. And a slab avalanche, and slab avalanches are just cohesive layers of snow that can be soft or they can be very hard, even like a tabletop. Uh, but a slab with that cohesive layer of snow is a little bit stronger snow over weaker snow. And that's the definition of a slab, stronger snow over a weak, weaker snow. And that's a classic example right there. Let's see how it can play out with these skiers in Montana in the Bridger range. You see the first skier is down, what, eight, turn, 10 turns? And then look what happens. He's in the flats, triggers the avalanche. Those fractures shot uphill. I think his friend's going, holy smokes, where did that come from? But look at that, all the way across that, that bowl, released. And I think all of us would look at that terrain and go, 
that's not scary terrain. That looks like really fun terrain. But in the right conditions, steep enough slope, and how steep? 30 to 45 degrees. And with a weak layer with some stronger snow, a slab on top, and triggers, you can have the avalanche. And triggers are people like us, skiers, riders. It can also be blowing snow, new snow. It can be explosives, like what they use at the ski areas. Uh, it can be changes even in temperature that cause losses of strength or that increase the mechanical stresses in the snowpack. Uh, really a big and potentially very deadly avalanche if someone had been caught in that one. Fortunately, the skier got was long gone at the bottom. So when it comes to the terrain, we've got to learn to read the terrain. When it comes to the unstable snow, with practice, you'll learn what to look for and you'll start knowing what it's what's out there and, and a bit of what it means. But we're really going to rely on the experts, on the avalanche forecasters with their forecast, we typically call them forecasts in uh, North America, bulletins in Europe. But we're gonna look to those experts because they're going to give us those uh, clues and give us descriptions of the stability or the instability of the snowpack. And three main resources to know for avalanche information in the United States is avalanche.org. In Canada, it's avalanche.ca. If you're headed to Europe, it's avalanches.org. It had an S on avalanches, so avalanches.org in, in Europe. We jump to this next one, and I know Tom's excited to show these little videos, but these are some examples of the forecast, and they're all very similar. They'll often start with a map, that'll show the danger ratings with uh, colors. They'll give a bit of a description. They'll describe the avalanche problems. And this is a pretty universal format that's used across uh, North America, Europe, uh, uh, New Zealand. And as we get into some other places, it's maybe not so much Japanese do it slightly different, but that information is there. So yeah. Get an app, and there's a really good app, and it's called Snowsafe. Works on uh, iPhones, works on uh, the Google phones, and it's a it's a great link to all the avalanche centers in their bulletins around the world. We don't need to see the rest of the videos going up and down, Tom. I think we can jump to the other one that people get the idea. So when you get a bulletin that'll have the danger scale, and it's an international scale, a few of the words are a little bit different, but boy, 98% of it is the same across uh, worldwide. It's a five level danger rating. And yeah, it gives you some travel advice, likelihood, size, and distribution. But I want you to take a look at the middle. Considerable danger. Boy, considerable danger means you know, dangerous avalanche conditions. But high danger means very high dangerous avalanche conditions. And I've got to say, as a user, I'm not really sure what that difference is. Um, as a forecaster, we can make some sense of that. But boy, when conditions are dangerous or very dangerous, it's still not a good time to be out there. The problem is, with our scale being five levels or five stages, is that the middle, considerable, is actually really dangerous. But when most of us look at something and it's in the middle, like this scale, we think that eh, considerable is just average when something's right in the middle. Yeah, but that's not true when it comes to avalanches. When the danger is considerable, I mean, natural avalanches are possible, but more importantly, human-triggered avalanches are likely. And we see a lot of accidents happen with considerable danger ratings. You go to the next one, I'll show you some numbers from Colorado. Uh, I think if you'll give it a click there, Tom, and we'll zoom in a little bit. And then we'll go one more click and you'll see some numbers on the right side of the screen. 
yeah, 40% of fatal accidents in Colorado occur at uh, considerable danger rating. When we go to Europe, that number is actually even significantly higher. And just pause for a moment, consider why do so many people get in trouble when the danger is considerable? Well, here's what I think's going on. When the danger is considerable, that's, well, I'll back up. Most avalanches happen during and just shortly after storms. When's the skiing? When's the powder skiing best? Well, during and shortly after storms. So when the danger is considerable, that's when the snow is also quite unstable. And the danger ratings, they don't go, we, we present them in a stepwise function, but they actually, the danger potential raise, rises exponentially. Think of it like trying to go across a two-lane road. That's low danger. Yeah, real easy to get across a two-lane road, look both ways, scoot on across. Moderate danger, we're going to double it to four lanes. Well, that's starting to get kind of sporty to get across four lanes of traffic. When you get to considerable danger, we've doubled it again to eight lanes of traffic. That's not just sporty or even spicy. That is dangerous. We get to the high danger, and that's six, the equivalent of 16 lanes of traffic. So, yeah, the danger, when it's at considerable and high, that's often some of the best snow conditions. But it's also the scariest time to be out there. I'm sorry, Tom, now we can jump to the next one. So when you look at a bulletin, and I know this might be kind of hard to see, and I hope all of you will be using here in the States, avalanche.org to get the forecast. Uh, you can also use avalanche.ca in Canada. And what is it for Europe? Yeah, avalanches with an S.org. But here's just an example from the from the Tetons. Uh, and you'll see, they'll give you some current weather information. It gives you a forecast for the day and typically for a, a, the next day or two. And then there's uh, the danger ratings. And you can see that on the right side with the different colors. We have low danger below tree line. Uh, near tree line and above tree line, the danger is considerable. Uh, so kind of a scary time. And then also take a look at the avalanche problems. And there's four parts to this. And these just give you more insight. And with more training and practice, those avalanche problems really give you quite a bit of insight to the avalanche dragon you're dealing with. What's really important with these bulletins is don't just look at the colors. Don't just look at the icons. Read the forecast because buried in that text will be some really important messages about what to look for, what people are seeing and experiencing, and that's going to really help keep you safe. And we'll shoot to the next one. Just another example through, and we can do it through brass, through the brass foundation, uh, <clears throat> through brassavalanche.org. You can get the forecast, not just for the centers around uh, North America and Canada, and, but also in, in Europe and other spots in the world. So brassavalanche.org is a great resource to get more of that information that's going to keep you help keep you out of trouble when you're out and about. Let's go to the next one, Tom, please. So... I mentioned earlier that the bulletins are really important because it's the pros that are giving you uh, insights of what to look for what, when it comes to unstable snow. But there's also six things, I've got five here, but six things that we call nature's billboards, the red flags of avalanche danger. And I'm gonna run through them real quick. Recent avalanches, that's your best clue of avalanche danger. So it's telling you where, what slopes are the most dangerous. Uh, aspect, elevation, slope angle, how deep this avalanche is. Those are the best clues. What's a recent avalanche? Depends where you are based on those snow climates. If you're in coastal areas, say the Sierras or the Cascades, uh, Western Canada, uh, typically two days. Any, an avalanche within 48 hours is a recent avalanche. You get to the drier, colder climates of Colorado, Wyoming, the Canadian Rockies. 
Eastern Europe. I, I would stretch that out to four or five days is what I would call a recent avalanche. Things just happen more slowly uh, when the snow is cold. Cracking and collapsing snow, even hollow drum-like sounds. Those are all great clues. It's literally mother nature yelling at you saying that, hey, dangers are, the avalanche danger is significant, pay attention. And I'm not talking about cracks just radiating around your skis, but cracks that are shooting out from underfoot, going out 10, 20 meters, 50, 100 meters, or even a whole lot further. That's telling us that that snow is poised to slide. It just needs a steeper slope to run on. Windblown snow, that wind loading is another big clue. And it's telling us what slopes are dangerous because that snow is being stripped off the windward side, blown over the ridge and deposited on the leeward side. And, that, and the wind can transport the snow at rates that it accumulates at rates much greater than it will ever fall out of the sky. In fact, I'll, I like to say that, well, snow's the building blocks of an avalanche, wind is really the architect. Yeah, heavy snowfall or rain, there's that word, we don't really like that word, but heavy snowfall. And you may read or have heard that anytime you have a storm of 12 inches of snow in 24 hours, that you should expect this, the avalanche danger to rise significantly, and that's true. But if you're a Colorado skier, how often do we have storms that drop 12 inches of snow in 24 hours? Well, for me, never enough. Uh, we only see about three or four of those storms a year in, in much of Colorado. You get into Utah, Idaho, Montana, into this California, Oregon, Washington, Canada, you can see those accumulations much more frequently. But yeah, heavy new snow or rain, because rain, yeah, it adds some weight, but it also changes the mechanical state of the snow very quickly. Rain's not good for skiing, it's not good for avalanches either. And if it's raining, well, there's probably been a rapid rise in the temperature. And that can come from rain, but really what I'm talking about here is just sunshine warming up those slopes. So the, especially those uh, sun exposed east and south and west aspects uh, that start getting a lot of snow or a lot of sun, I'm sorry, a lot of sun starting in later February and going through spring. But yeah, rapid raise in temperatures can significantly increase the danger. These are five main red flags that you'll hear about in a backcountry avalanche course. We're gonna add a sixth one for snow sports athletes. And that is when your training is canceled because of weather, probably means the avalanche danger is going up as well. Because the weather often produces unstable snow. As I said, most natural avalanches occur during storms or shortly thereafter. So yeah, training gets canceled, great. You can go out, make some, do some free skiing, make some turns, but really be careful of where you're going and even who you're going with. Let's go to the next one. So where you're going, let's look at ski resorts and how they manage their terrain, their guests and the skiers, both inside and outside of the ski areas. And what does that really mean inside and outside? We're looking at two pictures here, and you can see one on the right. This was, that was actually a fatal accident, just meters off of the off the piste. And this other one from Europe, again, just meters off the piste. And that slope looks really pretty tracked out with it, yet it's still avalanched. And that's one of the problems. We our ski patrols, our ski areas do a tremendous job to try and make the snow safe, but they can't guarantee safety. Let's go to the next one and we'll look a little more closely at the inside and outside or the in area and the out of area. So if we look at North America and New Zealand, we talk about in area and out of area because how we manage our, our terrain in North America and New Zealand is we treat everything within the ski area boundary as terrain that needs to be managed. Whether you're on the groomed runs, you're on the the bump runs, uh, you're on a marked runs, or you're in the trees between runs. Our ski patrols work really hard to mitigate the avalanche danger, but again, they can't eliminate the danger. As you can see this uh, photo from Lake Louise in, in the springtime. And those slopes, when they ran, it was late spring, but those slopes were 
closed early in the day because patrols are out there monitoring the snow within inside the ski area boundary. Let's contrast that, this next slide, with what's going on in Europe and for South America. So in Europe and South America, we talk about on-piste, on the marked ski runs, that's on-piste, and generally those are the groomed runs, and off-piste, which are the ungroomed runs. You look at a, oh, this trail map, this lift map from uh, Zermatt. Um, doesn't look like a whole lot of runs there, but it's like uh, 10, 15 times the size of a North American resort. Uh, but it has relatively few marked runs. So you want to learn about those runs and what the colors mean. Uh, they're a little different in Switzerland and Austria compared to how the rest of the world, you know, we call beginning or easy runs, beginner runs green and then blues and then blacks. Switzerland does it a little bit differently. Uh, they And their train's a little bit steeper. So they will start with the blue runs are the easy one and the red ones are the intermediate runs. Black are experts. And you might even see yellow. And yellow means it's not groomed, but it's still marked terrain. It's a piece, so it's monitored terrain. But you go between those red marked lines, the blue marked lines, you're off piece. And you're basically in the wild west of Europe. That terrain, just like in the photo on the right, that's off piece. And there generally is very little to no avalanche uh, mitigation done on those slopes. So be alert to that, that difference between off-piste and on-piste in Europe and South America. We'll go to the next one because our ski areas, besides monitoring the snow and trying to mitigate the avalanche dangers, there are signs that are up. And this is just a collection of signs that you might see around the world with closed, uh, with closed signs. Please don't go past the closed signs. That's a patroller. Um, but the signs marking the danger or just giving you kind of a heads up. In Europe, especially on the big uh, map board signs at the trams and the trams and the large lifts, they'll have the avalanche danger rating often given for their ski resort. That might be a little different than what the regional avalanche center is saying. And when the danger gets to considerable, you can see there's that little orange or amber uh, strobe light, and it will flash when the danger is considerable. So look for that. But to find these things, you've got to actually look for them. Don't just jump on the tram without looking for this information to see what's going on. And you'll often see signs with yellow and black. And that's, as we see with this sign from Poland, uh, yellow and black, the checkerboard, that's kind of an international sign of avalanche danger. And we'll go to the next one, Tom. So we're gonna start talking about equipment. We've talked a little bit about what to look for, how the ski areas manage the train, and let's take a look at uh, some of the equipment. We think of it in terms of nets, and this follows some reasoning by uh, James Reason, and really it's about the equipment. And here's the standard avalanche rescue equipment. The transceiver show, uh, try that again, the transceiver, the probe, and the shovel. And you gotta know how to use this stuff, not just carry, but know how to use it. Doesn't mean it's going to save your life, but it puts you in a place to be lucky. And even for some unlucky people, and this person had an airbag. So there's things, avalanche airbags, the reco, uh, an avalon. Those are all adjuncts that help help us uh, if we get in trouble in the backcountry. But avalanches also hurt and kill a lot of people that aren't even buried. So transceiver probe shovel. I'm going to throw in reco reflectors with it. That's the basic. But if you're going off piece or you're going out of area or maybe even in the backcountry, you want to also carry some other gear. There's the 10 essentials, and I'm not going to run through those, but it's basically just enough equipment that can keep you not necessarily comfortable, but it allow you to survive simply while you wait for rescuers to come help you. So just some of that equipment that you should carry. And one thing we don't have up there is we should have a headlamp because you want to be searchable and a whistle. You want to be able to be searchable to rescuers so they can find you. And just remember a broken binding. And if you haven't broken a tech binding, you will, it'll happen. Uh, it's going to make for a long time getting out of the backcountry, or even if you're just right outside of the ski area. And when you're searchable and you have a ways to 
a means to contact rescuers, you're going to get out a lot faster. Let's go to the next one. So as we start to wrap this up, I want to just mention these smart travel rituals. And, and what are rituals? Well, those are, are good habits. Those are things that you're going to do regularly and all the time. And our habits, our rituals, can get us killed or they can keep us safe. So be smart about that. So take a look at the avalanche bulletin and the forecast. As I said earlier, read it. Don't just look at the icons. Oh, somehow I became muted. Oh, I think I got muted, but I think we're all good here. All good. We'll keep charging away. But travel is if you left this gear at home because there's no guarantee that it's going to keep you alive if you're caught in an avalanche. But it does put you in a place to be lucky. Yeah, expose only one person to the avalanche danger at a time. Ski one at a time. Spread out. Don't hang out at the bottom. It's a great place to get pictures. It's a great place to get buried. So ski one at a time. Stick to the sides of the avalanche paths if you can and have escape routes and the main reason for sticking to the sides is you don't have to go as far to get out uh if if you trigger a slide if you're out in the middle you center punch something you may have a long ways to go to get out of that avalanche and you might not make it with practice and experience develop your own set of avalanche eyes learn to start looking at the terrain those slope angles as we've talked about looking for those five red flags plus what's number six yeah when trainings get canceled develop your avalanche eyeballs and then it's i say it's okay to say no not today but it's actually it's not just okay it's an expectation when conditions are dangerous or you're not feeling good about it say no it doesn't mean you're not you don't have to go out you might be able to go somewhere else and have a great time but don't go out and get yourself in trouble. The whole goal when you're not training and you're skiing outside the ski areas uh, or even into the backcountry is to be able to come home at the end of the day so you can do it again tomorrow. And maybe get some pictures so you can put it on social media. And as we wrap up with the last little bit here of my portion with the resources through the Brass Avalanche Foundation, brassavalanche.org, you can go there to get those uh, links to the bulletins to get the avalanche upcoming avalanche 101 talks that we'll be doing and we have a video and we're going to see that this evening it's really it is a powerful video <clears throat> so please use you know, our, our website it's a great resource brassavalanche.org and so as i wrap mine up just want to say thank you and you know i've got the uh six topics up here with the resources and as i did mention we'll throw a seventh in there about be smart, develop your ritual, those smart travel habits as you're heading outside of the area. And thanks everybody. And Tom, back to you. Well, thank you very much, Dale. Uh, we appreciate all of this education tonight. We're gonna do a Q and A right now. We've got a few questions up there. And uh, the first one, and wh while I'm giving this question to Dale, those of you who have questions, Put them in the Q&A or the chat, either way, and we'll get them to Dale. Dale, how do North American resorts mitigate avalanche danger within the resort itself? What are some of the techniques? Yeah, inside the ski areas, I think everyone's heard the explosives. So explosives are our big tool to use. But also the other, maybe even more important, is compaction. And it's about getting the terrain open early, getting that snow compacted. Because when we can compact the snow, we actually strengthen the snow and makes it, well, and stronger snow is generally more stable snow. Mm -hmm. So it's getting people out onto those runs. If you see early, especially early season, a run is closed, it's roped off, and boy, it looks really sweet in there. Don't 
poach it, don't duck under the rope because it's closed for a reason. And generally it's often because of the logs and rocks and stumps and holes and mine holes that are on those slopes. But yeah, compaction, explosives, mm -hmm. and then closures are our three main ways of managing uh, avalanche conditions in our, in, within ski areas. You know, just to follow up on that a little bit more, I know that in many of our resorts here in Utah, out in Tahoe, and around the country are starting to use concussion devices that are that are uh, uh, help to mitigate the snow without having to put patrollers out there first thing in the morning. Can you tell us a little bit about how those work and why are those such a great addition? Yeah, you're starting to really see these uh, these remote blasting systems being installed. In fact, like Little Cottonwood Canyon in Utah, I think there are probably like 30 of those units now, and they're going to be up around 50 or 60 of those units within a couple of years. And just as you said, in the Tahoe Basin, we're seeing them starting in Colorado. And the key thing with them is just as you said, Tom, it gets us away from having to mm -hmm. stick. It doesn't mean we're not going to do it, but it, it allows us to do avalanche mitigation first onto a slope to protect those ski patrollers that then are going to go out and kind of um, oh, poke around and, and pick out the crumbs with it. So that's a bad metaphor yeah. with it, but I think you know what I, what I mean. Yeah. So yeah. it greatly reduces the, the exposure that ski patrollers have to do to go out into that terrain. And ski patrolling, it's one of the most dangerous jobs in America. Dale, uh, uh, one of our uh, 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 viewers here tonight was wondering, uh, earlier you talked about SnowSafe, which I think might be a mobile app or a website. Can you give us that data again for all of the participants? Yes, it's called SnowSafe. And just one word, S-N-O-W-S-A-F-E, uh, if I'm remembering right. Maybe I should look at my phone real quick. Of uh, SnowSafe, and it has like a little Yeti. For its icon and you'll know that's the right one and with that on of uh, yeah on all the platforms it'll give you the links to use your mobile phone mm -hmm. to get those avalanche bulletins around the world here's a good question from robert mann and we see this so often if i were a coach from the east and i'm all of a sudden out in the mountains of the west and into more regular deep powder conditions what are some of the best practices to utilize with my athletes yeah, when your racers are coming out west to to ski, it's one it's having a talk with them, and it's really about res I'll say it starts with respecting those boundaries at the ski areas. Yeah, when you're free skiing, um, boy, it sure looks tempting to duck to duck under and sneak a few run or a few turns in, or take a shortcut through the trees. Uh, but doing that is really quite dangerous especially in this early season. So it's having to talk with your athletes, setting some limits of what they can do, what they can't do. If they're free skiing, it's where they're going to go. Who are they out there with? Mm -hmm. They've got a buddy. They're staying in touch. They're, they also, others know when they're going to come back. But just because you see tracks that head out onto a nice open slope doesn't mean you should follow them. And Robert, uh, if you want to reach out to Brass, we actually do do programs for specific clubs. So if you want to have us do an introductory program for your club, we can probably arrange that. For my friends, Hans, Hans Fugge, uh, uh Dale, you know a lot about this because you work for RECO, but uh, Hans was inquiring about the effectiveness of the reflective devices in clothing. Yeah, so the, the Avalanche transceiver is the primary device. Because the avalanche transceiver, this little radio-like device the size of our palm, that allows us to find one another. RECO is a tool for the rescue teams, the ski patrols, mountain rescue teams. And what the RECO system is, it's a radar. So having a reflector on your gear, uh, jacket, boots, uh, even in some of the other equipment, it makes you searchable to those rescuers with the radar unit. And it's really effective. Through air, it'll have a range of upwards of 200 meters. Through snow, easily through 20 meters of cold, dry snow. Now when the snow gets wet, it starts to reduce. But remember, if you don't have a transceiver, you're and you don't have a RECO reflector, you're not really searchable. And the RECO system in the transceiver 
you can search an area 100 meters by 100 meters in literally about five minutes or as fast as it takes to, to move through it. A trained avalanche dog, that could take upwards of maybe an hour. Having to use a pro pole, and I bet everybody has seen those lines with people out with the pro poles. That'll take 20 people four to six hours, and they'll probably have to do it two or three times. So the reco system is really important. It's kind of a backup, but it's always there. It's always ready. We have time for a couple more questions if you want to post them. We have an interesting one from uh, one of our viewers here tonight. Uh, Dale, when the terrain is really dangerous, how does somebody go and fix it? Or what should you do? Uh, uh, that's a great question. I mean, at the ski areas, we're fortunate because, as I said, we get to use explosives, uh, whether it's the hand charges or the remote blasters that, that we use. But, boy, if you're heading outside of the ski area uh, or into the backcountry, Generally, and this depends on snow climates, generally time is on your side. It's letting the snow set. And with time, generally it'll strengthen and stabilize. There's an old German saying, and I won't butcher the German and say it, but basically wait until the snow falls out of the trees before you, you tackle the steep slopes. The exception now is really those cold mountain areas of the Rockies from Colorado all the way up into, Al, Al, well, from New Mexico all the way to Alberta with it. We have shallow snowpacks. And when the snow is shallow, it actually gets weak with time. So early season, when that snow is less than a meter in depth, our snowpack is getting weaker and losing strength. So time can kind of work against us in, in some parts of the world. My friend Dar Hendrickson has a question kind of going back to RECO. Uh, can you put RECO on kids' helmets? And I know kind of where you're going to go with this, uh, but uh, where should RECO devices go on our clothing or on our gear? Yeah, when it comes to the RECO reflectors, most all of the reflectors are already uh, installed, so to speak, on in, in the gear, in, in the clothing, the pants, in the boots. Uh, that sort of thing. RECO does have uh, some adhesive, self-adhesive stickers that developed years ago to put on ski boots that work really well on helmets. Put them on the back of the helmet, uh, the top of the helmet. And as a rescuer, the great thing is because the system is so directional, you go right to mm -hmm. it uh, with that. But if you get that, those uh, add-on reflectors, don't put them on your skis. Don't put them on your snowboard. We don't want to dig one of those things up and not find the person. Yeah, that's yeah. not what we're trying to save. Yeah, exactly. The, the sticky reflectors work great on a kid's helmet. Okay, last question. Then we'll get to uh, Bodie Miller. I uh, appreciate him coming and joining us tonight. But um, Dale, is, uh, are courses like these offered uh, outside of the U.S.? I know the answer, but we'll let you give it and I'll supplement it. Yeah, they are, they're offered around the world. And I've got to say the US and Canada have really been the leaders in avalanche education. But across the globe now, avalanche courses are available for anybody who's, who's willing to, to show up and, and pay some money. Uh, the ARI programs, uh, they do programs in North America and South America. Um, in France, Switzerland, Norway, Sweden, they all have courses mm -hmm. and they're all fairly similar format in in what they do with that education is the great thing is even though our snowpack changes a little bit around the globe and you should know about those changes especially when you're traveling but the key the things to look for are the same cool and just a note on the brass courses we target our brass courses for north america principally in the united states but all of them are recorded and are available so happy to have anyone around the world participate dale i want to thank you for taking the time you bring a, a great deal of experience and education to us and we appreciate you sharing that with our group here on brass 101 thank you tom and thank you everybody for coming out tonight and let's get on to the real attraction tonight well, we really appreciate having Bodie Miller here. We're going to go to Bodie in uh, just a minute here. And before we do, I just want to make another little shout out for uh, those of you. And first of all, a thanks to those of you who have 
uh, tag the QR code tonight with your phone and have made a small donation to Brass. We put these programs on free of charge for the uh, general population with a big target to competitive skiers, snowboarders, and club programs. So anything you can donate, whether that's $10, $25, or $100, it all goes to help make these programs continue on free of charge and help to save lives. We really do appreciate that. Happy to welcome our athlete guest this evening, uh, Bodie Miller. Uh, needs little introduction, but I'm going to give you some of the hard facts here. Uh, Bodie Miller, six Olympic medals, one gold, winning the Super Combined up in Vancouver in 2010. Five World Championship medals, four of them gold. 33 World Cup wins, including two overall titles and one of only five men to win in five disciplines. And right now, Bodie is living out in Big Sky, Montana with his family, and he is the co-founder and chief innovation officer of Peak Skis. And he's going to talk uh, more about that as we bring him up. So uh, Bodie Miller, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. How are things in Big Sky? Uh, it's good. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm actually in Pocatello. Uh, we're on the way down to Park City right now. And uh, a last minute birthday, birthday trip, but uh, I pulled over and I was thinking it was a different type of Starbucks. So I apologize for any background noise. It's like in the middle of a supermarket. So if you hear some, some beeping, worry not. It's just uh, the background here. Well, that that's totally fine. Uh, Bodhi, uh, you are living out in Big Sky now with your family and give us a little sense of what's life like for Bodie Miller out in Big Sky now. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's crazy um, with with all the kids and their different routines and just trying to, um, you know, to grow grow into the role of, of father and husband. And, you know, I, I always take as much as I have the, the reputation for kind of not not paying attention much. Um, I take everything pretty seriously. So, you know, I, I'm uh, always trying to figure it out, but it's awesome up there. It's a great town, small. The kids love the schools and. I like to be able to give them a little bit of nature and really, you know, share share sort of some of my upbringing uh, with them because we were in Southern California before and that was there's a lot of good things there, but it's definitely not uh, the way that I grew up. So Montana is definitely a bit closer to that, and it's fun seeing the boys the boys thrive out there in the in the wilds. Did you have a fun Halloween with them? Yeah, we just barely made it back from Europe, so I was pretty jet lagged. It was it's a rough rough evening chasing you know six kids around uh when they're when they're cracked out on a bunch of candy but it was it was great i mean you know these are these are times that i again i take pretty seriously i i wasn't willing to miss it uh you know over in europe so we hustled back and um you know they go by quick i can i'm old enough now where time's really starting to fly but the, those those you know those holidays are special. You want to make sure you lock those in. It was fun watching the kids and Scarlett was big enough to actually go with them and, and go house to house and start trying to, you know, say trick or treat, which is always fun to catch. Well, that's great. Our great granddaughter had her first, she's three years old. So first time out trick or treating. So I know how that feeling is. Uh, so it's been almost a decade since you, uh, you were, uh, you, you've been off the world cup tour. You went back to Solden this weekend. I know that the men's race ultimately was blown out due to high winds, but what were your observations on the weekend with the women's event and what you were able to see of the men's event? Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, it hasn't, hasn't changed dramatically. I think that's the nature of world cup, right? It, it kind of stays the same, but mm -hmm. Um, it was disappointing not to to get the full race in, but we saw the first run and you get to see, um, you know, see the best racers in the world run that course. The women's race was, was really strong. Um, you know, Brignoni, I've always liked that the Italian style of, of attacking, I think is, was on full display. And, you know, I wasn't honestly surprised. I, I, I tried to give Michaela a pep talk, although she doesn't really need it from me. I, I saw her a bit the night before, um, about coming in there as a strong favorite. It's just really tough because she's, she's been so dominant and it's, you forget in a way, um, at least I've, I saw it more with other people. It wasn't a thing for me because I, my intensity was so high just by its nature of where my ability was relative to everybody else that my intensity kind of always was high, even when I was winning a lot, but she's so good but I think over the summer, it's easy to, to forget the intensity it takes to to compete on the World Cup. And I think what I saw, I mean, I, she didn't honestly look that comfortable on her equipment. I, I saw some funny shit going on with her skis, but um, it just looked like she wasn't quite 
finding the full gas pedal. Um, and Solden will eat you up if you don't if you don't stuff the edges in the snow down the pitch um, and really attack the breakovers right out of the start. You know, really, you just have to have that attacking mentality. I didn't really see that out of out of her. I mean, you know, Paula I thought did great on the in the second run. Looked like she brought some intensity. She had a big mistake in the first run, but. What stood out to me was the gaps, um, more on the men's side than the women's, but the, the gap between the, the front guys and, and then the next group back, um, to me, seemed pretty significant um, on the men's side. I just, I, it, not so much ability-wise, but at the same thing, attacking the intensity was just watching the first guys come down. It looked like they were really racing, and a bunch of the other guys looked like they were kind of skiing the course. Yeah, just a little bit more, Michaela. Uh, I think a night earlier, you had the opportunity to present her with the Journalist Skier of the Year Award, an award that you won in, uh, during your career. Um, did you have any comments to her that night when you presented the award? It's like one great champion to another. Yeah, and honestly, I talked to Odermott too, um, you know, just a little bit. I Again, I don't presume they're, I think they're, I mean, on paper, obviously, they're both completely different league than, than I, than I am. I mean, they're, they've far surpassed my entire career and they're both still, uh, you know, in the middle of it and, and jamming and young. So, you know, but I, there is certain aspects of experience that I, I always feel compelled to share with them. And that was a bit of it. You know, and I said, when you're in that gate, you know, trust your ability, but also know that you're going to have to step a little bit on the gas. You're going to have to push. You're going to want to, you, you should want to feel slightly uncomfortable, right? You want to, because otherwise you get to the finish if you didn't push and you didn't feel uncomfortable and you get to the finish and you're Michaela and you're, you're fifth or sixth or whatever. Um, that's tough. That, that's just a regret, you know, and of course you need those till you learn from those too. But if I can save them that feeling, I'd prefer it. I hated that feeling. I tried it a bunch of times and granted I wasn't good enough to do that. It was obvious, but in a way you saw at that time, Michaela is not good enough either. She didn't have any big mistakes. I mean, she skied clean more or less top to bottom first run and second run and just wasn't as fast as a bunch of other girls. And so it's kind of interesting to see because when she is skiing at her best and she has the intensity, she she's virtually unbeatable. So it's kind of, it was cool to see that, you know, as much as you think of her as so much better and she can ski easy, she can't, I mean, she still has to push. She's just good enough that when she pushes hard, she still doesn't make mistakes and looks pretty, pretty comfortable and confident. Yeah. Let's go over to the men's side. As you've watched the World Cup over the last few years, are there any men who are starting to stand out? Obviously, Marco Odermatt has had a sensational couple of years, but anybody else that you've seen that's really standing out to you that's kind of coming up right now? I mean, I honestly don't get to see that much. It's hard to find in the U.S. and with all the kids. It's, you know, I haven't been following it um, as much as I, I would maybe like to, but, you know, there's there's always guys who have who have the the kind of the intensity is what I what stands out to me. Ability is, you know, a lot of cases secondary. Um, but what's been disappointing is just the equipment. You know, I, I've said it, you know, my whole career, and I, I'm sure it's a little bit boring at this point, but if there's not equipment innovations, it's really hard to make leaps and bounds, right? Everybody at that level, they've all figured a lot out. They're 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 getting better all the time. Um but but by little tiny bits. And when there's a gap like it is to Odermott or, you know, or Pintero or some of the, the guys who are experienced, it's really a matter of, you know, without equipment changes, it's if the course suits you, right? It's if if the snow conditions suit you, you can be a little closer or you might even get them on a run or, or, or a race. But I just, I feel like the equipment has been so stagnant for so long that there's really not a lot of shaking it up. You're not, what you need is some equipment innovation so that these young guys find something that clicks and works for them. And then that intensity that they have, it comes comes to full fruition and they can actually max out their skiing. Because right now it looks like there's only a couple guys who really have the equipment set up that matches their physiology and their tactics and their technique. And that's it's a lot to mix up. But if you can't screw with the equipment, you're always trying to battle those other things. And that's just not easy to do. Let's shift over to talk about the Peak Ski Company. Uh, you're the co-founder and the chief innovation officer of Peak Ski Company. You launched in the U.S. last year very successfully. Now you're launching in Europe, uh, an even bigger ski market. Uh, I know you're not into racing skis yet, but I imagine, Bodhi, you've taken your knowledge of what you learned through racing, and you're applying it into this ski, and it looks like you're really doing it differently, like this is one of those really good new ideas and equipment. Yeah, I mean, there and there's there's a lot of them. Honestly, it's not you know, it's just like I said, the restrictions in racing are what really stagnated. I don't think it's, 
I, I, I think we're, yeah, I think we're in a place where there's probably a lot of good ideas out there, but a lot of them bump into the restrictions of this. Mm -hmm. um, the good thing about this one is it doesn't, it doesn't bump into that restriction, right? The, the keyhole actually gets around a lot of those rules um, in a, in a kind of a, a, a cool way. And I always was looking for innovations that, I knew Fist was going to try to make rules that blocked me from doing stuff. They made a whole bunch of them throughout my career, but um, but this one, I think they—I don't see how they can really make a rule that 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 messes this up. And I, I look forward to when it does get into racing. But in the consumer market, obviously, um, it, it's a huge win for for everybody. It's I was really I was really determined to come up with something that wasn't just for elite level skiers, wasn't just for extreme, and, and I certainly didn't want to pigeonhole it into just beginner skis. And so I. I think the keyhole is remarkable in, in the fact that it a, a first time skier who's never skied before can get on it, can identify that it's different and that it's better right away, all the way up to someone like Chris Davenport, um, who's on board now, Michelle Parker, um, and myself. It's just it's really easy to identify and it's very noticeably better. It's not it's not like a little tweak, which a lot of the stuff we've dealt with, I mean, it's not a knock on the other skis out there. There's lots of great skis, but they're all kind of pretty similar. At least each brand has skis that you could say are very comparable to the other brands that have, you know, a similar ski in a similar category, but this is notably different and, and notably better. And that that's a great place to start. And I think, you know, we didn't, it's not perfect. There's a, there's a ton of stuff that will improve, but um, yeah, it's fun to get it out there and see the response because people were really enthusiastic about it. And um, I, I thank the people who, who sort of took the risk, right. Cause it is always a risk trying something new, but um look forward to the response in europe i think the europeans will really react well to it it's good can you can you tell us a little bit about the keyhole technology how did it come about and actually what it is and by the way folks you can also go to peakskis.com it's a brilliant website that really walks you through the construction but Bodhi, tell us a little bit more about the keyhole technology yeah it's you know when i first built the shape skis with k2 and and kind of forced that through um i recognized right away that there was downside to that as well like i skied on them first and when it was smooth they arced right tip middle tail they're all tracking and it's clean and um but man when you get out of balance if you get on the tail and the ski is too torsionally stiff it really sticks and you can get you, you can expose your knees to really awkward positions and you know over the next years as the as the mainstream got got completely trans transitioned over to the shape skis you saw a ton of injuries uh, to ACLs and and stuff that knee injuries, especially that I wished I could have avoided. Um, the keyhole is is breaking the torsion of the ski just in front of the binding and really eliminating the need for side cut. So the side cut actually works against the fact of or the the function of the keyhole. So you can ski a ski with a much longer radius side cut and and still feel a actually much quicker and more positive power of the ski because it's kind of trapped under your foot the tip if you're relying on the tip to generate power and it flaps around on you you lose power whereas the middle of the ski can't really go anywhere it's stuck under there and it's much quicker it's it's immediate right when you touch the ski you feel that keyhole load up torsionally and and you just have and it allows you to ski a lot of different radius so you can ski a really tight radius like a slalom turn and then also extend that all the way out to basically super G turns on the same ski. And I thought, you know, that was really a, a positive innovation because I do think also that it, when you get back, you don't get locked on the tail because the keyhole is always balancing the tail, no matter how far back you are, it, it's still, it's stuck under your foot. The tip, you know, when you're in the middle, it's great, but when you get back, you can't, there's no pressure on the tip. So the tail becomes completely unbalanced. There's nothing balancing the tail. But when you're with a keyhole, it's basically under your foot. It's just in front of the binding. So even when you get back, that keyhole is still engaged and continues to pull the front of the ski around, which which eliminates that trapped, rotating, sit back and blow out the knee feel. So um, you know, I can't. Yeah, it, it really is something, folks. I encourage you to go to peakskis.com. Check it out for yourself. Bodie, just a couple more. I want to shift over to Avalanche Safety. Uh, you grew up in New Hampshire. Ronnie Burlack grew up there. I know that you knew Ronnie. I'm not sure if you knew Bryce, but uh, just talk a little bit about uh, Bryce and Ronnie as much as you knew of them and the impact that that's had in really changing the mindset of, of people across America on Avalanche Safety. 
Yeah, I knew I knew Ronnie since he was a little 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 kid. Um, grew up with him. Um, you know, like to believe that I influenced him into into the racer that he he became. But his mom probably was the bigger influence. She was an influence on me as well. I skied a lot with her. Um, and you know, I knew the family very well and, and definitely suffered with them on the loss there as well. And it's always hard going back to Solden where, where it, you know, it happened. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I think it, it just to, to sort of expound on, on, the, I was listening before when Dale was talking, I, I did it from a young age and I think that was more a function of just my upbringing, but it, it served me very well in skiing. And that is, he was talking about breaking a, a, you know, a touring binding in the back, right? If you're going to go back there, you bring a backpack. Uh, those are all kind of no brainers. Don't skip those, those really important steps. Right? You bring a backpack, but in your backpack, have normal stuff, like use your brain. Don't, don't be a sheep and follow the herd of like, or, or look in your backpack and be like, whoa, it's an awfully empty backpack. Maybe I'll stuff some, you know, some newspaper in there to look like it's full. Like, Put a flare in there. You know, a flare is not hard to find. That's a good thing to have. It'll help you light a fire. It's how people can see it. Bring a, you know, bring, um, you know, an extra binding, toe piece. Bring a, bring a whole binding. The bindings are so damn light now. You can have a little screwdriver and buy and new bindings. And if your binding breaks, you can go and switch it yourself and trek your ass out of there. It's just there's a lot of stuff that I kind of took for granted because I was raised sort of off the grid and really kind of self-reliant that I took seriously because I put myself in positions where I was like, Oh shit, man, I wish I had some different gear with me and there was nobody to rely on but myself. So I learned that lesson early, but that's my advice is, you know, really think, use your brain and, and, and it's fine to carry that stuff and not need it, but you don't want to need it and not have it. So, you know, I think everybody's got to make those calls for themselves, but if that's a piece of advice that people would listen to, I, I, I guarantee you, you'll be thankful. Well, one, appreciate that, Bodie. One last question, what you guys get on the road down here to Park City. But uh, about a week ago, you were on live television in Austria with your old uh, uh, nemesis, uh, Benny Reich. Uh, nice little reunion for the two of you there. Yeah, I mean, I always liked Benny. I honestly didn't think of him as much of a nemesis. There was only a few stretches where I was concerned about him. Uh, you know, he beat me a shitload of times, but that was all in my control. And I I took responsibility for that. When I skied my my races, I was I was faster than he was, and I think he he said the same thing many times. It was only a couple guys that I really considered my nemesis, um, where I'd ski what I thought was a winning run and get beat by him. And that was you know Von Grunigan did it, Herman did it, Eberharder did it, um, Kush did it a little bit, uh, Frederick Kovaly did it a few times, um, David Simoncelli, but right because he's so in the box he's such a politician he skis that way too he never never really takes risk he never really is innovative or like that way but he's so damn good that he was always there so i mean he basically let other guys implode me included and then he'd, he'd snatch up the wins but um you know he laughed about it too because he said he always wanted to ski more you know where he would be sort of unbeatable but um, by the time he he figured it out that that's what he wanted to do, he was he was already slow. He just had trained himself to not take risks, and he couldn't figure out how to go any faster. Well, Bodie Miller, we appreciate you taking the time to stop on your drive down to Park City tonight. Uh, all the best to your family as you head down here. Bodie Miller, thanks for joining us here on our Brass 101. Thank you. That was Bodie Miller. Great to have him with us here today. We're going to get into a showing of off piece before off piece before we do. I uh, just want to uh, uh, remind you again and uh, thank everyone who has donated tonight. Uh, we've taken quite a few donations tonight. We really appreciate your help. All of these webinars we do at Brass 101 are free. Uh, we appreciate your participation and telling a friend. You can help us by just uh, scanning the code, giving us 10 bucks, 25 bucks, 100 bucks. It all goes for such a great cause. We're going to show a film now that was introduced in 2018, and every time I introduce it, I get a little bit more choked up about it. This is a recreation of the accident that occurred on January 5th, 2015 in Solden, Austria, an accident that took the lives of two amazing young men. It's hard to watch. It's poignant, but it's very, very real. And that's why we're dedicated to Brass to bringing you this education. So please stick with us as we show you this screening 
of off-piste tragedy in the Alps. Dispatch, possible two avalanche victims buried. I see something. Oh, oh, man. Man. Yeah. Is this one of your friends? Yeah, that's Bryce. No pulse. Starting CPR. One, two, three, four, five, six, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Lift on three. One, two, three. Are you sure there were only two? Yeah, there's two. Just two, just two. Okay, we're gonna find him. Ready! Not breathing, no pulse. Sorry, CPR. can turn deadly in a matter of seconds. It's hard to believe that such a tragedy could happen. The accident has left many in the skiing world in shock. Tragic news tonight as two elite skiers training for a spot on the U.S. Olympic team are killed in an avalanche. Rescue crews from Solden were on the scene immediately with multiple helicopters. Our thoughts and prayers are with those who are apparently lost in this uh, specific incident. I'm Bryce Astle. How does the gangster chains play into effect in your slalom skiing? Um, pretty aerodynamic. Happy birthday to you. I was shattered. And I know everyone around me was too, and can't even possibly imagine what it was like for the families. Losing Bryce and Ronnie was a huge hit to the U.S. team. They are the next generation. These two guys were the best in their disciplines. Uh, Bryce in slalom, Ronnie in downhill and Super G. They were the next up-and-comers. They could be the guys competing in the Olympics. This is the famous smile because uh, he had just won U.S. Nationals, Juniors. He always had my back and it just, it makes you appreciate it more now that he's not here, you know? Bryce was such an important part of my life and after we lost him, it was a pretty easy decision for my wife and I to name our son Bryce. He lived for every moment. He would get done training and he would go out and he would ski. And this is a card that we made up at the time we lost the boys and it has Bryce so amazing on skis and Ronnie in his element going 70 miles an hour through the air. He was kind, and he was grounded. Ronnie, he was always just a jokester. He wasn't afraid of the, the World Cup vet. He would just always speak his mind to me, and I love that about him, you know? Watching him, laughing, just made me think, wow, I have the best brother ever. He was a good teammate, he was a good friend, a good son, and we had a lot of fun together. January 1st, 2015, I took Bryce to the airport. He was going to hook up with uh, Ronnie Burlack and the rest of the U.S. ski team. They were going to Europe to uh, train for uh, Europa Cup. We got to Solden, and it had just snowed a lot. Obviously, there's no training because there's so much snow. So we sent everyone out to go ski around and have some fun. Just seeing snow that's untouched and being like, this is a dream come true. We were having an amazing time. We could see the bottom of the valley, we could see the road, so we started skiing. I just remember skiing across this face and all of a sudden I just heard cracking. Oh! 
Everything underneath me started moving. I saw Bryce, and I heard him say, oh shit. I never even saw Ronnie. We stood there, and we watched them go. Nothing made any sense. Then it just instinct took over, and there were people who had skied down right before us who saw everything and pulled out their transceivers. Are they wearing beacons? No, no beacons. No, no, beacon. no avalanche equipment. I need shovels. I need shovels. That was when I realized how stupid we were being. Okay, does anybody have a probe? We're at the bottom of Solden One. We need helicopter, two more patrollers, hasty team, and an AED. Probably took 15 minutes for helicopters to come in. I was like pretty aware that it had been too long. The first thing that appeared was Bryce's boots sticking up out of the snow. He was upside down. His boot was six feet from the surface. Came across Ronnie a few minutes later. Ronnie, we got him. Did you get him out of the hole? That was an image that I'll never forget. The concept of riding up a lift, skiing on a trail, and we're in danger, that did not exist in any of our heads. The coaches and the boys did not receive any orientation or any training regarding the dangers of skiing in Europe versus skiing in North America. None of the young men in that group knew the difference between on and off piste. Off piste in the United States is defined as out of bounds, going through the gate, going under the rope, that's not what the rules are in Europe. When you are off the groomer, you are off piste. In Solden, the day before the avalanche that killed Bryce and Ronnie, there had been heavy snowfall and strong winds. What that did was, is it put a lot of weight on top of the snowpack, which was fragile. Once these skiers got onto that slope, it couldn't support the additional weight. That weak layer fractured over a wide area, and that slab came crashing down. It produced debris that weighed almost 7 million pounds, the same as almost 10 747s. It takes all of 20 minutes to, to learn and to be educated. You want to make sure you're prepared. There are five points that are always really good to remember. You want to get the gear, get the training, get the forecast, get the picture, and get out of harm's way. First, you need the gear. Going in the backcountry, you need a beacon, a probe, and a shovel. And unfortunately, that day in Solon, the boys did not have that. Ronnie! I would have done anything for rescue gear, especially a shovel. You can always increase your chances of being searchable if you're unlucky enough to be caught in an avalanche by having reco reflectors in your equipment and clothing. Getting the gear is useless if you don't know how to use it. You've got to get the training. Take an avalanche class. If we would have taken just one class, we would have known not to ski down that terrain in the first place. One key thing you're going to learn in every avalanche class is that you have to check the forecast every time you ride. None of us checked the forecast that morning. It would have taken just two minutes on the gondola ride, and none of this would have happened. So when you're out on the snow, you got to get the picture. And what does that mean? That means pay attention. Are you seeing recent avalanches? That's by far the most important clue. That's like Mother Nature screaming in your ear. If we had known it wasn't controlled, we 100% would not have been there. Finally, get out of harm's way. What that means is only one person is riding the slope at a time. We were breaking one of the simplest rules. In some ways, it's a miracle that all six of us didn't die. Once you get to the bottom, you need to get out of the way. That way, if somebody else in your group triggers an avalanche, you won't be caught. 
These five simple steps everyone should know about and everybody should be trained in. Coaches, parents, athletes, administrators of the program. Everything that we did could have easily been prevented. I wish I could say that I couldn't have done anything to save their lives. That's just not true. Anytime you have a major accident like this, it causes a ton of introspective thought. We realized that we really needed to look at it from the top down, bottom up. How can we make sure everybody's more educated to avert and reduce the chance of anything like this ever happening again? That's why we at Brass are creating avalanche education specifically for coaches and athletes. We're also creating snow safety policies to be followed by ski racing groups. Ski racing is definitely a dangerous sport, but where we're going down is a really highly regulated area. You have all the fencing, you have the snow prep, you have all these things that are out there to keep you safe. When you get out there in the backcountry, there's, there's none of those luxuries. For the people who assume that just because they know how to ski terrain or they know how to rip down a mountain because they ski downhill, it's, it's a very different beast. Don't let this happen to you and your family. Get educated, get out there, so we can keep skiing for Bryce and Ronnie, so their legacies live on. Thank you all for joining us for Brass 101 tonight. If you want to support us, please make a donation to Brass, and you can do that at BrassAvalanche.org. We'll be back with another program in early January to commemorate Bryce and Ronnie. Uh, I hope that the video off-piste was impactful for you. It tells a very real story, and we hope that at Brass, we're creating the awareness so that won't happen to you. Thank you very much. Enjoy the season and ski and ride safely. We'll see you again soon.